Hey Joel, I've been a big fan for a while now and thankfully I've never had anything happen to me that might necessitate the writing of a scary story. But then recently, I asked my mom about an unusual memory that I had from my childhood which I then found out was just the tip of the iceberg. Now for memory, my version of the story goes kind of like this. This happened when I was 8 years old, so Thanksgiving 1993. Me and my family drove way across the state to spend the night with my aunt and uncle at my mom's side. I was close with my cousins on that side of the family and my mom and her sister were really close too so we tended to spend a lot of holidays together. We drove over to their place, I remember playing with my cousins for a few hours then we all sat down to dinner after being summoned by my mom and aunt. We all sat down, loaded up our plates and the last thing I remember is my mom and my aunt telling us that we were going to have dinner in the upstairs bedrooms. I have this distinct recollection of not wanting to eat my food upstairs, but then my mom said, anyone who eats their turkey upstairs gets to watch the Mighty Ducks on the big TV in the mommy and daddy bedroom, okay? And that was all that needed to be said. And we were all up in her bedroom before we could say, attack the puck. My mom laid out a blanket for us, put all of our plates down on it, then we just sat there, perfectly content. Mom stayed with us, but she didn't eat anything. Whenever we needed to use the bathroom, she would walk us there and back, but then any time we wanted to go downstairs for any reason, she'd tell us to wait where we were, and then she returned with whatever it was that we wanted. The way I remembered it, it was the best Thanksgiving ever. We got to eat dessert up there too, we watched a whole bunch of other movies and then we all fell asleep in my aunt and uncle's bed before driving back home sometime the next morning. And that's where my memory of the event ends. And like I said, for the longest time I remember nothing except how cool it was to be able to watch the Mighty Ducks while eating my turkey. I somehow knew it was an exception. We asked if we could do the same thing in the years that followed and were always told no. But then last year, I just so happened to ask my dad about that Thanksgiving and why, just for one year we got to eat in front of the TV. And I remember he gave me this look, and it being one that I didn't recognize. I feel like we were all used to seeing our dads with like three basic facial expressions. The first is that I'm not mad right now, but I'm ready for something kind of look, with the second being straight up mad, and the third being my sports team just won a game kind of smile. But that day... My dad gave me this look that I could only interpret as fear. Whatever the answer to my question was, it wasn't some half-buried memory made fuzzy by too many blue ribbons. It was something he remembered very well, and was something that frightened him. He let out a big sigh and told me, Don't tell your mom I told you this, and then went into the grown-up's version of events, which is as follows. So everything I told you to start with still stands, and by that I mean everything was going fine until we sat down to dinner. Then as we were eating, the phone started to ring. My uncle got up to answer the call, and it was a man asking for my aunt. So he calls her to the phone, and then sits back down to eat. A minute or two later, my aunt comes back in, but she's quiet, and she's not touching her food. My uncle asks her what's wrong, but she tells him she's fine. It was just someone from work calling or some other excuse which got him to drop it. Then another minute or two goes by and the grown-up starts seeing a car's headlights turn into my aunt and uncle's driveway. They're not expecting any other guests, but it was Thanksgiving, so it wasn't out of the question that someone might stop over unexpectedly. But instead of just acting curious like the rest of the grown-ups, my dad said that he watched the color drain from my aunt's face. My uncle was halfway to getting up from his seat and my dad said my aunt grabbed him by the arm and said three hushed words that had the color draining from his face too. Get your gun, she said. Obviously, my mom and dad wanted to know what the hell was happening, but there was no time to really explain. All my aunt told them was that we might all be in a lot of danger, at which point my mom started gathering up us kids and taking us upstairs. We'd all been sitting at the kids' table at the time, and although it was right there next to the adults' table, I don't remember anything except the moment my mom told me to go upstairs. As I've already told you, she then stayed upstairs with us, making sure that we didn't see anything or hear anything of what happened next. 
but then headed up by my uncle and my dad and aunt went to see who'd showed up unexpectedly. Having listened to the advice of my aunt, my uncle had his 45 ready to rock, but later said that he had no idea who was out there or why my aunt was so scared and all the unanswered questions had him just as scared as she was. But still, he did what he had to and walked outside with his gun ready to go. According to my dad, they walked outside and they can't see anything right away because the guy's headlights are shining bright and just blinding them. But then they take a few steps off the porch and their security light lit up the stranger's car. My dad said he could see the guy standing behind his open trunk but he couldn't see his face at all at first. Meanwhile, my uncle is marching towards the guy asking him to identify himself and the guy steps out from behind his car, holding his gun. My aunt screamed, then ran back inside, but my dad said that he was frozen knowing that if this random gun-toting stranger shot my uncle, he'd have to try and rush him from the side because there was no way he was going to let some maniac gun into his house where his kids were upstairs. But my dad also said that round about the same time he saw the gun, he noticed something about the guy holding it. He was drunk as a skunk. He didn't so much as step out from behind the car as stumble out from behind it, and as my uncle approached him, the guy looked like he had no idea how to use the gun he was holding. My uncle raised his own and kept telling him, You point that thing at me and I'll kill you. And by some miracle, the stranger either couldn't load the thing properly or couldn't get a good grip on the side because my uncle made it all the way over to him to knock him out before he could even look up. Dad said it was a nasty hit too, but even so, he'd never been so relieved in his entire life. After that, my dad rushed him, disarmed the stranger for good, then he and my uncle basically sat on the guy until the cops showed up. I say sat on the guy more like sat with him because when he woke up from being knocked out, he had next to no idea where he was and was so out of it that he didn't even try to get up until he saw the lights of the sheriff's deputies approaching my aunt and uncle's house. The deputies cuffed the guy, then took him away, and all the while me and my cousins are up in the back bedroom, completely none the wiser that any of this was happening. Like I already said, mom stayed with us until bedtime and I remember my aunt and uncle coming in to say goodnight too. Now looking back on it, they were as cool and calm as anything, not even a hint of what had just unfolded downstairs, but after we went to sleep it was a different story. My aunt told my mom, dad, and uncle for the very first time the story of why she'd packed up and moved away from her home city, and it was all because of some psycho that she'd made the mistake of getting hitched to. He didn't hit her, he wasn't a violent man, which made sense after the sorry display that he made with a pistol, but he found other ways to make her life absolutely terrible. At first, she didn't need to work because he could take care of her and she didn't need her own checking accounts because why would she? My aunt was too naive to realize that when her ex-husband turned bad, not having her own money would mean that she was basically stranded. Her ex took the phone out of the house, threw all the food out one at a time, then left her alone for a night and she had to beg on the street for the pay phone money to call my grandma to come rescue her. She was so ashamed of having gotten into that situation, of having been so stupid as she put it, that she swore my grandma to secrecy, and it was a secret that she took to her grave with her. And some time after, my aunt moved to Chicago to be closer to my sister, met my uncle, and the rest is history. She thought that she'd left that whole sad chapter of her life behind, and after ten years of not hearing from him, she had no idea if her ex was dead or alive. Not until he showed up at her house early on that Thanksgiving evening with a gun and two gallons of gas in his trunk to burn the house down after he'd shot us all. At least, that was his plan. The guy ended up going to prison. Not for as long as anyone would have liked him to, but if he steps foot back in the town my aunt and uncle live in, not Chicago by the way, then he'll go straight back to prison, no questions asked. Obviously, 30 years have gone by, and my parents and aunt are all in their 70s by now. That means that her ex is going to be around that age too, and hopefully he's somehow found a way to make peace with the whole thing, and he's not going to try and reach out again. 
But that's the thing that actually frightens me about this whole story. It's not actually over yet. Everyone just kind of assumes that he's not going to show up again, mostly on account of how old he'll be. But from where I'm standing, it looks a lot more like hope than assumption. They're all just hoping this guy isn't going to show up again and the idea that there's some impending family tragedy on the horizon, it makes me feel like there's a blade hanging over my neck, just waiting to drop at any time. I'm scared what my aunt went through twice will only really ever be over when her ex is dead. At least I hope so, because God knows I don't want it to end with anyone else dying except him. Thanksgiving is coming up and I know you sometimes make videos based on whatever holiday is on the horizon, so I wanted to send my story in about that time of the year. You see, I had a great childhood. I know that in the age of people wearing their traumas on their sleeve, that's not a very cool thing to admit, but it's true. I don't have any issues with my mom or dad who are still together after 40 plus years of marriage, neither was I bullied at school. And unlike my two best friends growing up who had liver problems and diabetes respectively, I never had any chronic medical issues to deal with. And I used to think that I was lucky. Everyone seemed to have some messed up thing going on in their family, be it a divorce, a sibling or parent with a drug or alcohol problems, anything that meant that they were broody and world wary by the time we hit high school. But I didn't and on top of that I couldn't exactly see anything on the horizon either. But during Thanksgiving of 2005, when I was 15 years old, I found out that everything in my family wasn't exactly perfect either. So I have an uncle that's almost 20 years younger than my dad. Dad was an only child all through his teenage years, then one day he got the news that his little brother was on the way. My grandparents always said my uncle was an unexpected blessing, which I guess means he was an accident. But then with him being the baby of the family, he was doted on and spoiled like it was nobody's business. And this ended up with my dad and uncle being worlds apart in terms of age, but also worlds apart in terms of personality too. My dad spent a few years in the Marine Corps, and he wasn't like Jocko or anything like that, but it definitely stuck with him. Whereas my uncle was a struggling musician, then a struggling artist, and then a struggling writer, all because my grandparents blew so much hot air up his butt that he thought that ambition could just trump talent. I always thought he was a cool guy, and I could never understand why my dad gave him such a hard time. He always seemed so laid back and chilled out, and I could talk to him about all the stuff my dad found boring or had no time for. I was always pleased to see him whenever he visited, and he and my dad never argued in front of me which I appreciate looking back on, at least until the Thanksgiving that I'm about to tell you about. So one night, we're having dinner and my dad tells my mom that my uncle is bringing his girlfriend over for Thanksgiving. I remember being excited to meet her, as anyone dating my uncle must be as cool as him, right? Mom and dad seem kind of nervous, emphasis on kind of, but put it down to never having met her prior to some big family occasion. Cut to maybe a week or two later and my uncle shows up for Thanksgiving and starts introducing his girlfriend to the whole family. She was very attractive, I'll say that much, but she was definitely out of place with her leather jacket and tattoos. Now that being said, my family were as friendly as ever and tried their best to make her feel welcome. Dad made a toast, we ate dinner, then everyone kind of went their separate ways to do the after dinner stuff. The men went to watch sports highlights, the women had coffee around the breakfast nook in the kitchen, and the younger kids played among themselves. But me, I went upstairs to my bedroom to play video games. I can't remember how long I played for, but it was mid-evening when I went downstairs to grab a soda, so maybe like 7.30 to 8 o'clock or something. I walked downstairs into the kitchen, and right by our refrigerator was the door to the garage. I opened up the fridge, grabbed a soda, then after I closed it and started walking out of the kitchen, I heard something coming from the garage. To my knowledge, everyone is either sitting around the TV or playing bridge in the dining room. There's no one left in the kitchen, and there definitely shouldn't have been anyone in the garage. So, obviously the question was, who was in there, and why? It could have easily been maybe a raccoon, I guess, but my biggest fear... The one that had me reaching for the door to take a peek outside 
was the idea that someone had broken into our garage, the same garage that had direct access to a house full of totally unsuspecting people, and myself. I remember reaching for the door handle, real slow, then pulling it open real fast and then just scanning the interior. Something caught my eye right away. It was my uncle's girlfriend. Her eyes just looked wrong. There was blood coming out of her nose and mouth, and at first I thought my uncle was trying to help her, but then right there with me watching, he hits her. And he hit her so hard that her head just jerked back in this weird ragdoll kind of way that I can still remember clear as day even all these years later. And the second he did, I slammed the door closed and ran into the TV room and managed to get the attention of everyone there by just pointing towards the kitchen and saying, Uncle Tony in the garage... His name isn't actually Tony, by the way. I just don't know how to describe the moment without dropping a name. Everyone ran to the garage. The cops were called, and within maybe 10 or 15 minutes, what had once been this nice family atmosphere had turned into total chaos, which spilled out into the streets and ended with my uncle in a cop car and his girl in an ambulance. I didn't get to see all that much before my mom and dad screamed at me to get up to my room. They were so angry that I thought that they were mad at me for a while, and afterwards, they explained something to me that I don't think childless people are even capable of conceiving. So much of what a parent does bears no other purpose than to protect their children. Sometimes a parent can come across as a total jerk, just a soulless, joyless husk that wants nothing more than to suck all the happiness out of their kid's life. I know there's times when parents overstep the line and genuinely are cruel and abusive to their kids, but... That's not what I'm talking about here. I'm talking about the things that feel like punishments or restrictions that are actually nothing but manifestations of love and protection. And that's pretty much the reason my mom and dad shielded me from the truth about Uncle Tony. They didn't want to cut him off or have me resenting them for not allowing us to have a relationship, so they went about this difficult balancing act of allowing him to visit me without filling my head about stuff that he was doing in his life. Stuff like doing drugs, committing petty financial crimes, stealing from grandparents, and as I saw with my own eyes, being a complete piece of human garbage and how he chose to treat the women in his life. Which reminds me, like I said, Uncle Tony, again, not his real name, got picked up by the cops after my dad and some neighbors basically beat the crap out of him and pinned him down in our driveway at that time. But his girlfriend, she had to stay in the hospital overnight. My uncle had beaten her pretty bad, and I think the doctors were scared that she had a concussion, but all she had was a broken nose and a busted lip, I guess. Mom and dad paid her hospital bills, and mom went to visit with her sometime after, I'm guessing to ask about her pressing charges. And to this day... I still don't know for sure if my mom went over to talk her into it. She's always claimed that all she said was something like, we'll support you no matter what your decision is, and that the girl went ahead and pressed charges all of her own free will. I'm not saying that's impossible, but I've heard way too many stories about battered wives and girlfriends being too afraid to talk to the cops for years before they suddenly snap and decide to do something themselves. And maybe that was the case with my uncle and his girl. Or maybe my mom knew that unless someone stepped in and encouraged her to do the right thing, the same pattern of misery and violence would just go on and on until someone either died or got sent to jail. Just to be clear, that's entirely speculation on my part, and I guess I'll take my mom's word for it that she didn't intervene or interfere. But either way, it went to court and my uncle pled no contest seeing as there were a ton of witnesses against him, and he ended up doing three years of a six-year sentence, at which point my parents totally cut him off. And by that time, I was completely okay with him doing that, as I had absolutely no desire to see my Uncle Tony ever again. Now I know it might sound kind of messed up, but for the first few days after it happened, I wasn't angry or horrified or appalled at what my uncle did. I was heartbroken. I couldn't believe someone that I looked up to so much was capable of doing something just so awful. I just couldn't make sense of it. In my mind, there had been some kind of terrible misunderstanding, and I still haven't really forgiven myself for thinking this, but I couldn't help but think this girl had done something to deserve it, I guess. Was she trying to steal something? Had he caught her doing drugs? 
There had to be some logical reason why my laid-back, incredibly cool uncle would do something so terrible. Spoilers, but there wasn't a reason. At least nothing that could possibly justify putting his hands on her in the way that he did. And I had to hear the whole thing from my mom, following her visit to the still-recovering and now ex-girlfriend, to really understand what had happened. One of the things I wonder in the days after was why his girl hadn't screamed. If they were having a fight or whatever, then how had it gone from near silence to physical violence without any kind of escalation in volume? That was just one of the reasons why I very naively thought that there must have been something more to the story, right up until my mom told me the following. She hadn't asked my uncle's ex the same question, not directly anyway, it just came out during my mom's retelling of her visit. My uncle's ex didn't scream when he started hitting her because she learned that if she did, he'd only hit her harder. And this did two things. Number one, it gave me an idea of just how long the abuse had been going on for. And two, it made me hate my uncle. And I mean really hate him. There was, and is, something so sickeningly sadistic about that one little detail, and once I had it in my head, there was no coming back from it. That was the uncle I didn't know I had. That was the version of my uncle that my parents tried to shield me from. I guess that's maybe an overdone concept with some of the stories that you probably get sent to you here. As in the old, I thought they were sweet but they were actually a monster, but I also understand why they don't ever really get old either. It's something a lot of people go through in their lives, realizing that sometimes things aren't quite what they seem. But a lot of my school friends got that lesson way early, whereas I was way into my teenage years when I realized that sometimes... You think you know someone, when really, you don't know them at all. This happened when I was 13, on Thanksgiving of 2011, but it feels like a while ago. You see, after dinner, I was sitting at the top of the hill not far from my house, at the base of the hill, there were trees that went along the edge of the school. Kids would often start at the top of the hill and race down, with the first to cross through the trees being the winner. A simple game made fun by putting a steep hill in the mix. Well, I was all by myself and felt like doing it anyway, so I stood up and ran down that hill as fast as my legs could go. I was the fastest kid in the world at that moment. The next thing I knew, I was on the ground looking at the sky and it felt like someone had taken a sword to my neck. I felt it, looked at my hands, and saw blood. A lot of blood. I focused my eyes and saw it, tied between the two trees that I ran through. A fishing line, about three stands worth, twisted together to give it strength. And I stared at that fishing line so confused. Why? What? How? And that's when I heard them. Maybe 20 feet away, a group of what looked like 8th or ninth graders who I had seen around the school sitting on their bikes, pointing and laughing. I could hear one distinctly say, I can't believe he didn't see it. What an idiot. I never figured out who they were, but they were the reason why I was in pain. And they were the reason why I was bleeding. I didn't know any of them. I'd never done anything to deserve anything from them. But still, they'd chosen to do it out of some pure malicious sense of boredom. I was so confused and in so much pain, but worst of all I was scared that they weren't finished with me. I got up and ran with everything left in me down the back towards my house. I ended up tripping over the curb in front of the white hen pantry, which is now a 7-Eleven. I was lucky and saw some lady that helped me back up and she dragged me inside and bought me some bandages and patched me up and told me to go home. I didn't trust anyone for a long time after that and refused to do anything without first slowly and cautiously inspecting everything before I let myself even have any fun. Almost having my head cut off truly did ruin my carefree childhood days. Firstly, I don't know what your policy is on this kind of thing, so feel free to leave it out if you really don't think it's necessary, but I'd like to give everyone a little trigger warning regarding the topic of taking your own life. 
I personally don't think I need them, but I've talked to enough people with these kind of ideations over the years to know that they're greatly appreciated by those who think they need them. So if you don't mind including this one, I think people will be very grateful. I guess I gave it away already, but you see, I'm struggling with these kind of thoughts for a long time. I ended up getting addicted to painkillers after a sports injury, and although I tried as hard as I possibly could to break the cycle and kick my habit, I kept on failing time and time again. Addiction counseling just didn't seem to work for me, and once I'd picked up street drugs a few times and knew my way around, keeping me away from opiates became harder and harder. In the end, I decided that the only way out, the only true way out, was to take my own life and stop being such a burden on absolutely everyone around me. I only made one solid attempt, and I survived, and after I ended up in the hospital, my parents were informed of what I tried to do. It was a sort of come-to-Jesus moment when I realized how far I'd fallen, and from then on, we did things different. There were no more rehabs, no more treatment programs in the city. I was going out to the middle of nowhere, to where my mom and dad owned a little vacation cabin, and I was basically going to live there until opiates just weren't part of my thought process anymore. It was like a bridge between where I was and wherever I was going to go next, and although I didn't know where exactly that would be, I sure as hell knew that it wasn't going to involve any pills or powders that I couldn't buy at a mom-and-pop drugstore. I ended up staying at that cabin for four months, and it was in a real sorry state that I found it too. I guess that just showed my resolve though. Cleaning it gave me something to keep me occupied, and I guess the whole process is maybe good for the mind or something because it definitely had this therapy-like quality to it that had an awesome effect on my peace of mind. So like I say, I made a house, a home, so to speak, then ended up staying there for basically the whole of the fall and then including Thanksgiving. I'd been there a while by that point and I'd be lying if I said that I didn't miss my family. In fact, I was just jonesing for some company all around. Someone my mom and dad suggested driving up to visit with some turkey, stuffing, and cranberry sandwiches. I was in no position to turn them down. They traveled up and we had a nice afternoon just hanging out. And then we all went to bed at a pretty early hour before rising just as early. I made us some eggs. They packed up their things, but before they left, my parents asked if I wanted to go for a walk. It had been a while since they'd visited the cabin, so they figured that it'd be nice to just sort of reacquaint themselves with some of the old trails that we used to walk during our childhood vacations. I remember the old route because it led up to this big iron bridge that ran high above a shallow stream. Walking across it always used to freak me out as a kid because looking through the railings down into the stream gave me the willies in a big way, but the more we walked there, the less freaked out I got and eventually it became one of my favorite spots whenever we visited the cabin. So, we got to going on our walk along those winding trails that went up and up until we reached the iron footbridge. Then when we got there, we see this other guy standing by the railings looking over the edge. There are plenty of other cabins in the area, so I just figured this guy was doing the same thing we were, taking a little walk, maybe before or after dinner, just to clear his head and digest his turkey. We didn't call out to him or anything. I guess I figured that we'd just give him a friendly nod if we made eye contact while walking across the bridge. We also weren't talking very loudly. We were just enjoying the stillness of the forest, so I guess that had us talking in library voices or something. Go figure. Anyway, my point is, this guy didn't see or hear us until we were almost right up on the bridge, and when he did, I knew something was off just from the look he gave us. He got startled, and had this sort of you-caught-me expression that I found really confusing at first, but then, he did what he did, and that look made a chilling amount of sense. The second after the guy saw us, he threw himself off the bridge. My mom let out this really shocked gasp while my dad went to grab her like he was trying to protect her from something that couldn't actually do her any physical harm. Me, on the other hand, I just ran forward towards where the guy had jumped. Looking back, I don't really know what I was thinking, and to be honest, I don't really know if I was really thinking at all. 
I guess it was just some gut reaction to try and stop the guy from falling. But he was in free fall by the time I even stepped foot onto the bridge. He didn't do it like one foot up the railing then jumped. He sort of rolled himself over. I guess to try his best to land on his head or his neck. But things didn't work out like that for him. He didn't get to go quick. And after I saw what remained of him, I've never been able to get that image out of my head. I don't want to go into too much detail and turn this into some big, gross kind of affair, but just imagine what it would be like to somehow survive a fall that breaks dozens of bones, but still has you awake and feeling everything. The image was bad, but I honestly think the noises he was making were worse. He couldn't really scream. He was trying to. He was trying with all he could to express just how much agony he felt, but for some reason, probably in some part due to the devastation his body had just endured, he couldn't actually scream. The only sound he could make was this croaking noise, like a big bullfrog, and he only made it one or two times before I ran back towards my parents to turn us back towards the cabin. Thankfully, the cell reception in the area wasn't too bad, which meant that my first 911 call connected just fine, and I was able to tell the dispatcher what had happened. A forest ranger was first on the scene, but by the time they got there, the guy lying in the shallow stream had stopped making all of his terrible noises. I honestly think that even if the ranger had been there with his medical supplies the moment the guy jumped off the bridge, there still wouldn't have been a thing that we could do for him. He was a mess, beyond saving, and I have no doubt that he died in absolute agony. I moved out of the cabin a month later, and although it wasn't the whole reason, witnessing that man take his life up near the bridge was definitely playing a part. It's not like I was having nightmares or anything either, and I really don't want to sound too self-absorbed here because what happened to that guy is a tragedy all on its own, but I couldn't help but think to myself, that could have been you down there, writhing in agony, trying and failing to scream your last scream. And I think that was the time that I knew that I was going to be okay. Because the one thing that I was certain of is that I never want to end up like that guy. I know how it feels to be that desperate. But what I realized was that I never once considered that taking my own life would be a selfish thing to do. I thought the selfish thing was to try and carry on living. That it was cowardly to just go on living knowing that I was going to be an addict my whole life. But the truth is... Choosing life is the bravest thing a person can do. Waking up, getting dressed, and going to face whatever life throws at you, that's the really difficult part. And there's personal glory in even the smallest of successes. That, and I wouldn't wish seeing a body like that on anyone, not even a dumb junkie like me, because now, I do believe people can be haunted by the dead. Not by some sort of apparition, but the ghost inside their head. For Thanksgiving of 2009, I took my family over to my sister's place. They lived in Chattanooga, which was a long drive from where we lived in Indianapolis, but I had no problem driving all that way to spend the holidays with my brother-in-law. He became my best friend during those early dad years as I didn't really have anyone else to ask advice from. My own father passed away when I was a kid and my friends who actually got it together and had families didn't do so until their 30s. So when it came to getting dad advice, he was the first person I turned to and that little conversation evolved into one of the closest friendships of my life. So we got there, he cooked us an amazing dinner but afterwards he complained that he wasn't feeling so hot. He went to the bathroom, then came back saying that there was fluid coming out of his ear, but was also quick to reassure us that he'd struggled with ear infections in the past and that it wasn't anything we needed to worry about. The night went on perfectly normal after that. We put the kids to bed at around 9, before adult bedtime ended up being around 11.30 to midnight. But then around 1am, my sister wakes up to her husband trembling and sweating in the bed next to her, saying that he felt like he had a fever. He goes to the bathroom, takes some medication, but he's still awake and shivering at around 3am with no signs of feeling any better. 
The next morning, my sister got up early to take care of their boys and was mindful to be quiet so he could get some rest. I swung by in the morning with breakfast for them and my sister informed me that he was still sleeping. Right away, I thought that was weird because he was never one to let a hangover or keep him in bed, so I knew that he must have been feeling pretty terrible. The two of us left to leave him to get some rest, tried to keep the noise from the boys to a minimum, and let my brother-in-law get some rest as we all had plans that afternoon. Afternoon rolls around, and after calling a couple times and them not picking up, my wife and I went by the house at around two to check on my sister and brother-in-law. The moment we got there, I got this terrible feeling, and when I stepped inside, I took no satisfaction in finding out how right I was. The moment my sister opened the door, she was white as a ghost as she told me to follow her upstairs because she desperately needed help. We sprint up the stairs to find my brother-in-law breathing extremely erratically, with all this bright green snot coming out of his nose. My sister was shaking him to get him to wake up and you could hear the fluid in his lungs as he was breathing in. As I started trying to wake him up, my sister ran over to get water to pour on his face to rinse off the snot and try and startle him awake, and at that point, he stopped breathing. I looked up at my sister and we both knew that things were getting wildly serious and we had to act quick. She was fortunate to have had a few CPR lessons, so she started instructing me on exactly what needed to be done. We dragged him off the bed of the floor and started alternating breathing in his mouth and chest compressions. And this is when things started going from bad to worse. We screamed down to my wife to call 911 and have my mom get the kids out of the house. My wife then ran up the stairs on the phone to see the two of us performing CPR on him. As I did the CPR moves, a truly horrifying amount of blood started coming out of his mouth and nose and this was something that I was completely unprepared for. I didn't even realize it was blood at first. It was dark brown not like the movies and TV shows depict. So there I was, bawling with my sister as the two of us were pounding on my brother-in-law's chest with my wife standing over us on the phone with the operator. I decide that I'm going to check on him and with my thumb I open his eyelid. Big mistake. You cannot unsee that. His eye didn't focus, didn't move, didn't do anything, and I pulled my hand away. As I was still performing CPR, my sister runs around the bed to get shorts on my brother-in-law before the paramedics get there, so when they take him out, he's just not completely nude. Now another thing that I wasn't ready for, my brother-in-law's bowels evacuating as we try to get his underwear on. Seconds later, my sister is standing there cupping her hands over his stuff, crying as she's saying, he's peeing, oh my god, he's peeing. I yell back that we're doing everything we can and that it's going to be okay, but we both knew that things were not going to be okay. It was only a question of how bad they were about to get. The paramedics arrived, and the moment they did, we got out of the way to let them work. At this point, I was so relieved, they just needed to get him to breathe and start his heart. And this is the 21st century, right? They do this kind of thing daily, right? I thought. They started chest compressions and got him on monitors and a belt looking thing that went around his chest and performed the compressions for them. It was a terrible thing to watch, as it contracts and sends him heaving forwards and then back down over and over. We drape a sheet around his waist before they drag him down the stairs. I run to the bathroom because I am now very aware of the taste in my mouth. It was like I had a mouthful of pennies and vomit. I rinsed out my mouth as they got him downstairs and I soon found myself screaming, get the kids outside now. My wife takes them up and gets them to the back patio. Thankfully they didn't see him the way he was and we ran out the door and got to the hospital. The ambulance wasn't there yet so I waited outside. As it arrived, they wheeled him to the door, chest still regularly heaving upwards, eyes still closed and I ran back to the waiting room and told my sister and wife that he'd arrived. After that, all we could do was wait. What feels like hours go by and they pull us into a small room and the doctor comes to speak to us. The moment he asked if he could close the door, I just kind of knew. He informs us that they tried everything but that my brother-in-law had passed away. 
I'm not totally sure what happened next. No tears at first, disbelief and confusion. My sister is hysterically crying, screaming that it's not supposed to be this way, they were supposed to grow old together, and I eventually lose it and everyone was inconsolable. Things have since gotten better though, or at least more normal, but still I can barely believe it. The company I work for was awesome about it and they paid for grief counseling for my sister and I. Also, between friends and family, my sister received close to 20 k that she is putting towards the boys' college funds. And you really find out who was important in your life really quickly. I have amazing friends and family and wouldn't trade a single one for the world. We later found out that he had a nearly perfect storm of issues, infection that manifested streptococcus pneumoniae, meningitis, and he had a lung infection, ear infection, enlarged heart, and eventually septic shock. If I can give any advice to anyone that reads this, or hears this, go to the doctor if you feel even remotely sick. Within 11 hours of shivering in bed, he was dead. Don't think about how you're going to pay for it, just tough it out. Because just one second with those you love is more valuable than any dollar amount, and I mean any. My brother-in-law was a healthy guy too. He worked out regularly, did jiu-jitsu, biked everywhere cooked all of his meals from organic fruits and vegetables, did yoga, and was only 39 years young when he passed. He was a magnificent human being, an amazing martial artist and a wonderful father, and he will be missed. When I was just 11 years old, my dad and I went for a walk just before Thanksgiving dinner. We lived just north of Columbus back then in a little suburb called Shawnee Hills. It was a great place to grow up and we had a big house with my own bedroom and a big backyard too. At the end of this backyard was a small gate and beyond that was a whole bunch of woods and then a deep, fast flowing river that's probably still popular with summertime kayakers. I remember being incredibly hungry but dinner wasn't going to be ready for another hour or so. So instead of sitting in front of the TV, moping, my dad offered to take me on a walk to the river. Walking down there to throw twigs and stones into the water was one of my favorite things to do, mainly because I was never allowed to do it on my own. I have a real vivid memory of throwing larger stones into the water and finding the big plomp that they made upon splashing into the current to be extremely satisfying. Plus, as my dad said, if we used up the last of the daylight to walk down there, toss a few stones and then walk back, then dinner would be on the table just seconds after we arrived back. It seemed like a flawless plan at the time, so I accepted his offer and off we went. We walked all the way down to the stream, shining flashlights even though it was still half light outside, then when we got there, I did my usual thing of looking around for the biggest rocks possible. My dad joined in and for the next few minutes we're picking them up and tossing them into the river until my dad comes across one that looks particularly promising. I remember him distinctly saying, oh we got a big one here, and then he took a step up onto one of the rocks at the edge of the river and kicked one of his feet against the one next to it, I guess to try and dislodge a piece that was cracked and coming away. Then, in one fluid motion, he slipped hit the rock that he'd been standing on, then went crashing into the water. It sounds so perversely awful to think about it now, but at the time, I actually thought it was kind of funny. He slipped, and when he hit the rock on his side, he made this funny sort of uh, sound, and then after he fell into the water, I honestly thought he'd just pull himself out right away, just like he did whenever he jumped into our swimming pool in the summer. Only problem was, he didn't. And as I walked up to the river's edge, I caught a glimpse of him floating away downstream. Recalling that moment has suddenly made this very difficult to write about, so excuse me if the quality of my writing just takes a sudden turn. But seeing him floating away, or rather, seeing a flash of the fabric of the jacket that he was wearing just bobbing in the water as the fast-flowing river took him further and further away, that's what made me realize that something was wrong. And that's what had me running down the riverbank, desperately calling out his name, and wondering why he wouldn't answer. The more I ran, the more I started to cry, and by the time he was truly out of sight and I couldn't run anymore, I completely fell apart. 
I didn't want to accept that he was gone. But at the same time, something in my gut just told me that he was dead. But that didn't stop me from running for help, and I ended up running all the way to my neighbor's yard where they called 911 and carried me back home to my mom. Again, the memories of what happened next are difficult to recall. Not in the sense that they're hazy, but because I can still remember how painful it was. The worst part was seeing my mom and older sister hoping that, somehow, my dad had survived lying unconscious in a freezing cold river for who knows how long. I wanted to share that hope so badly, but I couldn't. I think part of me always knew that he was never coming back, so getting the news that his body had been found wasn't quite as devastating to me as it was to my mom and sister but it still almost destroyed our family. And even after all these years of trying to process it, through therapy and self-help books, or religion and booze, we're still not really over what happened that Thanksgiving. It's something I think about every single day, without fail, and somehow even the smallest, most inconspicuous little things bring the memories right back to me, sometimes at distressingly short notice. I guess this isn't the kind of story you're used to receiving as a submission and... I can understand why some people might think that this is more sad or tragic than outright horrifying. But to me, when I think of horror, true horror, I think of that moment when I realized that my dad wasn't okay. I think about that flash of his jacket that I saw floating in the water, and how quickly the current was dragging his unconscious body downstream. Sometimes I think I'd happily swap that memory for a thousand nightly visits from Freddy Krueger, and I'd happily share my apartment with a ghost or two, even more so if they'd help me with the utilities. Anything to get that picture out of my head. Anything to have an actual goodbye with a man that I never had a chance to really know. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST. And there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday nights. If you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, or send it over email and you might even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember...